Hi, everyone. Welcome to our webinar today on hospice and palliative care beyond the myths. I'm going to just wait a little bit to make sure that um, those who are joining are able to connect to audio and listen in. We are glad to have you here um, with us, and we are also glad to have Angela Novas here. Um, she will be our speaker today, but I just want to give some reminders for any questions that you have, please put them into the chat and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. Um, also, please remember to keep your questions general and not too personalized as our presenter is not able to comment on specific cases. Um, so for let me introduce Ms. Angela Novas. Um, she is the Chief Medical Officer at the Hospice Foundation of America. Angela completed her BSN at the University of Maryland School of Nursing, followed by her MSN at the George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Specializing in hospice and palliative care, she subsequently completed postgraduate work at the University of Colorado prior to becoming certified as a hospice and palliative care advanced practice nurse. She has worked in healthcare for more than 25 years in different capacities and roles, and has spent the last eight years of her career in palliative and hospice care in a variety of settings, including general, inpatient, skilled, and long-term care facilities. Welcome, Angela. Thank you, Lourdes, and thank you for the Calangia Carcinoma Foundation for inviting me today. Um, so thank you for attending. Uh, I want to just go through briefly about some of the myths associated with palliative and hospice care. And hopefully by the end of this webinar, you all will have a better appreciation. Um, we will have dispelled some of those myths for you. So at the Hospice Foundation of America, we do have an Ask an Expert um, email address where members of the public can reach out to us with questions and concerns about how to access um, hospice and palliative care, um, and also concerns they may be having with the type of care that their loved one is receiving. Um, a lot of the myths that we commonly experience and get questions on reflect um, a belief that hospice means giving up and losing hope in some way. Um, and that the hospice care is going to let people die or worse even that they're going to do something that will uh, hasten death. Um, other people think that once you go into hospice, there's no turning back. It's only for old people or it's only for people who have cancer. Um, and really hospice and palliative care, in particular palliative care, do treat patients and their families across the whole spectrum of, of ages, including children. So most people, I think, have misconceptions about the differences between palliative and hospice care um, that can be quite challenging to understand. And they use both of these terms interchangeably. Um, there are some differences. Um, in the services provided and the eligibility that's required to receive those services. Um, but basically, palliative care is emerging as a, a, an additional field of expertise and specialty within the healthcare system currently. Um, while everybody who is in hospice care does receive palliation of their symptoms, there are some distinct differences in eligibility for them. Palliative care is basically for families um, and it's family-centered care that seeks to optimize quality of life. Um, they're experts at anticipating, preventing and treating suffering or distressing symptoms. Um, usually most palliative care providers will adopt an interdisciplinary team approach to achieve these goals of care. 
um, will support patients and families with physical, emotional, social, and spiritual needs during the course of their illness. Um, I'm seeing sort of within the healthcare um, sector that some palliative care specialists, physicians, and or nurse practitioners are setting up as palliative care consultants, and they may be sole practitioners or sole providers who will help with symptoms such as uh, pain or intractable nausea and vomiting, and they have a particular specialty in those fields, and they will consult with your own physicians or medical teams to um, offer their consulting services um, to help palliate those symptoms if they're needed. Um, so palliative care is basically available to anybody with serious illness, regardless of the prognosis. Um, if they're experiencing poorly controlled symptoms as a result of that illness, it can be provided concurrently with life prolonging therapies or interventions. So to explain that, it basically means that um, you can continue chemotherapy, you can continue receiving blood transfusion, you keep your current um, medical team um, without changing it, without needing to um, give up medications or other services, you can be an inpatient at the hospital, and you still will be eligible for these services. Um, and that basically hospice care offers the same interdisciplinary team approach. They are they will palliate symptoms and hopefully make um, the patient more comfortable while supporting the family. But the difference that's critical is that um, hospice services, in order to be eligible, um, there's generally a prognosis needed of six months or less. And this has to be certified by two physicians. And during hospice care, you do typically give up the curative and life prolonging therapies. They're either discontinued because they're no longer working or they have been discontinued because the patient and or their family um, is requesting them to be discontinued. Um, so that's really the, the major difference between the, the, the two services. Um, now there's a little asterisk at the bottom. And, and unfortunately, that's why we can't get into too many very specific questions today about individual care and individual insurance, because this is a general overview and these are the general rules. However, if you have a child who has a life-threatening um, illness, they can be on hospice care and receive all of the benefits of hospice care while continuing to seek curative treatments. Okay, um, certain insurance companies, private insurance companies also offer what's called concurrent care and you can still continue to receive all of your life pro uh, prolonging or curative therapies while still receiving the support of an interdisciplinary hospice team. Your private insurance may have that as an option. So we never say never. Um, every case is individual and every patient's need are assessed and, and a plan of care um, produce that meets their needs within the confines of whatever insurance they have or what their goals of care are. Um, you know there's a lot of mystique about hospice and the H word and how people feel it's only for people who are in their last days or hours of life and that it hasn't doesn't have anything that would appeal to them until that time. But as a genuine continuum, um, of your lifelong health care, it's something that's going to come up, whether or not it's framed as palliative care or hospice care, or whether those services are just provided to you. Um, as you progress through time and age, there is going to be a natural 
um, inclination to less aggressive treatment potentially, um, less focus on curative care. Certainly if you've got somebody who's very aged and very sick, um, the focus may switch from curative aggressive interventions to just being comfortable, just wanting to stay at home, not wanting to go to the hospital anymore. If somebody's been hospitalized repeatedly and had many, many trips to the emergency room and just wants to stop. And of course, hospice care in particular, um, if you look at the continuum, hospice care extends beyond the death of the individual person. Um, the individual person and their family and caregivers are considered the, the patient, the focus of the care in hospice. And so death and bereavement services are offered under hospice care um, to again continue to support the family um, post-death. So while it may seem as if there's no upside of hospice, um, it's all a matter of perspective, I guess. Um, mostly people who come onto hospice services, as I mentioned before, are just tired. Um, they want to take back control of their lives um, and they want to have autonomy over where and how they spend their last days, weeks or, or months. Um, for the most part, people don't choose to die in the hospital. For the most part, Americans, research has shown over 80% of Americans would prefer to be at home, surrounded by loved ones in a place that they're comfortable in and can be made comfortable in without spending their last days and, airs in, uh, days and hours in an intensive care unit or a hospital unit. Um, and so they're really taking back control uh, uh, and we're there to facilitate whatever their goals of care are with that regard. Um, people on hospice care, probably not surprisingly, depending on how aggressive interventions have been or how unpleasant medical invention, interventions have been up to that time, do actually report a, an increased quality of life. Um, particularly when they're electing hospice services themselves, I think, they um, that sense of autonomy and taking control really does have an impact, I think, on the mood and depression scores, which tend to be lower. Um, there's greater patient satisfaction, knowing that they don't have to keep making those trips to the hospital. They can stay home. Whatever symptoms occur can be managed for the most part, in their home where they're comfortable. Um, and we find, we see quite a lot um, that people actually improve um, once they enroll in hospice care. And that's because of a lot of the symptoms and side effects from multiple medications that are being used to either aggressively manage or cure the disease progression um, are causing a lot of unpleasant side effects and it can be exhausting. And um, once they come onto hospice or palliative services and all of those medications are reevaluated for um, benefit versus risk and medications that are unnecessary or inappropriate, um, given the expected prognosis, once they're discontinued, many people report they actually do feel better on fewer medications by the time all of the interactions between them and all the side effects that they've been, been enduring have gone, they are actually able to enjoy whatever is left of their life without that um, pill burden. Having people who are very familiar with end of life care and disease progression and management. Um, it can also improve autonomy and peace of mind and comfort for the family to have somebody who is willing to have um, very honest and frank conversations 
about what the future will look like for whatever time that has is remaining. Um, hospice and palliative care providers, as specialists, do understand the physiology involved in end of life care. And I won't say in all cases, but in many cases, are able to preempt most of the symptoms that you would encounter. Um, and of course, having the support of a team of people that are available to you 24 seven is also a big relief. Um, from the caregiver's perspective, it can be a labor of love, but nonetheless exhausting and stressful and demanding. And to know that they have somebody that they can pick up the phone and speak to um, around the clock in the case of um, hospice care and just confide in somebody, have somebody answer the phone and be able to answer their question um, honestly and with empathy can be a huge relief to them. And of course, palliative and hospice providers are all experts at symptom control. That, that's what they do. That's their specialist specialty that's what their focus is um, much in the same way as um, a heart surgeon they, they are specialized in in what is involved in treating and curing and preventing heart disease all we do is identify symptoms and treat symptoms and manage them So eligibility um, is always a question. And again, this one should have a little asterisk on it because palliative care is a separate field and a separate specialty aside from hospice care um, is, a, is developing. Um, there are challenges with reimbursement and um, but we're finding more and more specialists who are going into this arena. Um, and it really is appropriate for anybody who is living with a serious illness if they're expecting or anticipating an escalation in symptom burden. Um, and they treat all manner of symptoms um, and conditions. And this is the one that can be um, brought on board as an ancillary service to your current caregivers without any limitation of the treatments that you can receive um, or limitations in specialties or specialists that you already have as part of your medical team. But you know, again, the distinction is your medical team who is treating you for congestive heart failure, that's their specialty, but the symptoms that may be peri surrounding that diagnosis um, they may not be specialists in, in that. They may not be specialists in controlling the shortness of breath or that you may be getting as a result of your congestive heart failure. Um, and so it really is worth bringing up. And if, if you're specialists, if you are somebody who's had a life altering or life changing or potentially um, terminal diagnosis, this is a discussion that you can have with your providers at the time of that diagnosis and ask if you could have a consultation with a palliative care specialist. It doesn't commit you to hospice care. Um, it does give you the advantage of having an extra team who are helping to support your disease at whatever stage that disease or condition is at. So hospice care, the eligibility is um, a little bit different because it does require two physicians to um, certify that within their best medical um, knowledge that you would have a prognosis of six months or less. Of course, people um, can come on to hospice services and they're on for a couple of days because they waited arguably too long to ask for hospice assistance and other people can stay on way past 
that um, six month prognosis. We can't predict, um, there's a lot we can predict and there's a lot that we can anticipate and plan for, um, but as of yet, um, we've been unable to capture um, the spirit or the will of the person. Um, and so once you come on to hospice services, there's an anticipation of six months. It could go shorter, it could go longer. If it goes longer, um, all that would mean is that care can be extended for as long as it's needed, so long as you continue to meet um, eligibility criteria for whatever disease that is that you have. Um, and you can continue to be recertified as long as you continue to have that prognosis, that you are continuing to deteriorate, that you continue to have, as far as we can tell, a limited prognosis. Um, anybody can ask for hospice services. It, oops, um, usually a physician involved in your care will bring that up at an appropriate time but I would never advise anybody to wait for that. Um, you can bring up hospice services or the potential of receiving them at any point in time that you would like. And I think a lot of um, people working with serious illness fear bringing up hospice or palliative care with their patients. Sometimes they fear that that will give the families the impression that they have given up on them and they're kind of afraid to bring it up. But for the most part, they welcome the families or the patients bringing it up and they are happy to talk about it as something that could be on the potential horizon or something that would be appropriate for you now. And it's certainly worth you bringing that up if they haven't already. Um, and particularly if you haven't talked about any kind of advanced care planning with your medical team, um, that's something that they would likely welcome you to bring that topic up if they haven't already. Um, and aside from the medical criteria and the six month prognosis with hospice, patients generally have to want or not general you have to want this service nobody's going to tell you you're on hospice we're done with you um, we, we're just going to do this to you um, it's something that the patient if they're able to has to be agreeable to or the family is requested and that's what's commonly called the hospice philosophy they have to be um, willing to accept these services willingly and not under duress of any kind. So this slide is handy um, and it just shows you the basic differences in the levels of care from palliative to hospice. Um, under the hospice Medicare benefit, um, that's kind of interesting and, and can be appealing to families because aside from having that hospice team coming to the home multiple times a week, um, your people generally have a nurse coming to the home at least once a week. And if symptoms start to progress and more nursing care is needed, that typically will be stepped up to two or three times a week or even daily. If if symptom burden is outweighing the pace that we're able to control it. Um, but also durable medical equipment um, can be expensive. Um, it can, you know, it can be a financial burden on the caregivers or the patient themselves, knowing that they will get certain um, medical equipment like a hospital bed, uh, oxygen if they need it, um, walkers, even Hoyer lifts, um, if they're appropriate in the home and safe, safely used in the home, they would all be provided by hospice free of charge under the Bennett, uh, benefit. And so are things like incontinent, um, pads, um, if they're needed at end of life, um, 
you get uh, I'm sorry, I've lost my mind. So, um, so in addition to the nurse coming out and durable medical equipment being available to you, uh, most hospice families have a nursing aide that comes out and the average for that is three times a week to help with bathing and changing or feeding um, and assisting the family with activities of daily living. There'll also be social workers um, available um, and a multidisciplinary team, including physicians, case managers, spiritual counselors, volunteers, and bereavement counseling. That is more or less the difference between the palliative care and the hospice care. With palliative care, they don't typically provide all of the um, durable medical equipment that's provided free under hospice, although they may certainly facilitate you getting the equipment that you need or even like prescriptions for it. So what is the interdisciplinary team that I, I've been speaking about? Um, and again, this diagram gives you a little bit um, of information about how it works with the, with the, I shouldn't really say terminally ill patient because they may or may not be, again, if it's a child, um, they would be receiving hospice or palliative care, but certainly the patient, the family and the caregivers are really at the center of the hub um, and the team surrounds them, hopefully providing support and services that help them through this journey. Um, volunteer services can um, vary greatly by area. Um, and obviously uh, hospices are only able to recruit the volunteers that are available to give their time. But some of the Volunteer services might be music therapy, um, coming to the home and spending some time, um, just sitting reading with you or watching the television or watching the big game, um, just so that the primary caregiver or family member can step away for a few minutes and a volunteer is there taking care of their loved one uh, and making sure that they're safe and occupied um, and has somebody to engage with. Um, some of the more fancy things are massage therapy that tends to be very much in demand um, that hospice pro volunteers provide. Um, but all of this is designed to provide a, a network of support that comes to you rather than you having to seek out this kind of service. So there's a lot of myths about what services to expect from hospice. Um, a lot of people continue to think that um, once hospice is on board, that they will have a caregiver in the home 24-7, um, taking care of their loved one. And that really couldn't be further from the, the truth in, in most of the situations. Um, these services are deployed to assist family caregivers or paid caregivers and supplement that caregiving rather than replace that caregiving. Um, I think we already talked about the medical equipment. Perhaps at this point, I, I should talk to you a little bit about the, the levels of hospice um, care and the services that are offered. Um, most of the hospice families um, receive what is known as a routine level of care, which is where the nurse comes to the home once a week. Um, hospice is on call 24-7 for any needs outside of that. There are hospice aides, social workers, and pastoral care coming to the home routinely. But if a patient begins to have symptoms that we are struggling to control in the home for any reason, whether that means that uh, they need nursing care to titrate and increase medications, liaise with the physician on call to get orders, uh, multiple orders usually throughout a 24 hour period, at that 
point if those symptoms, if we can't control them with nursing visits, um, hospice will provide up to 24 hours with a nurse being bedside in the home, working with you, the family caregivers and the patient to get those symptoms under control. If for any reason, we still can't do that after a 24 hour period, um, per the Medicare guidelines, um, you would then be eligible to be what we call a general inpatient, still under hospice, um, where they would, you would basically go to what would be a hospice hospital, um, where there are nursing staff, medical staff on the unit in the same way that they would be in a hospital setting. Sometimes these general inpatient units are at hospice house, um, if your hospice has one of those, but they can be um, anywhere that's a Medicare approved facility, basically. Some hospitals now have designated hospice units where you continue to receive your hospice benefits um, while you are an inpatient at that facility in the hospice unit. The anticipation with this level of care is that once your symptoms are well controlled and managed, that you would be able to go home with your new plan of care and medications um, so that your wishes to go home were met, if that is at all possible. Um, and that's part of the continuous hospice benefit. Usually, if you are on hospice and decide you want to go to the hospital, um, the Medicare regulations state that you cannot be both a hospital patient and receiving the hospice benefits. So at that point, you would be um, terminated from hospice care, which would allow you to receive hospital care um, until such time as you didn't need it and were being discharged, at which time you could re-enroll in hospice care, assuming you have, still have eligibility. So probably more than the services to expect, people mostly like to know about what not to expect. Um, so hospice isn't really going to focus on curative therapies or medical interventions prolonging life. So generally what that means is um, you wouldn't receive IV fluids or IV, IV antibiotics at home um, or injectable pain medications. Um, and you would forego things like blood transfusions for the most part, um, certainly chemotherapy, radiation, and any of those services. And I think we talked about it, it really isn't a replacement for nursing home care or other caregiving um, in the home. Um, if your loved one or yourself uh, are in a nursing home of any type or description, um, while hospice would come to you and provide hospice services in those facilities, room and board at those facility is not covered by the Medicare hospice plan. So families or the individual or the individual's private insurance would still have to pay for that. And I think we already sort of talked about the 24 seven availability that's available with hospice care. Um, and I don't mean to imply that if you call at three in the morning, a person will answer the phone, um, depending on where you are in the country, whether it's rural or urban. Um, certainly, you may be asked to leave a message, but certainly people are on call 24 seven. If they're on another call or they need to be paged, they will return your call at three o'clock in the morning. With any kind of concern. Um, 
So this is when we get a lot. I think a lot of people think that once you're in hospice, that's it, you're in hospice and there's, there's no way out of hospice. It's just the end. Um, but we do have people come onto hospice, um, come into care, like the hospice, don't have a problem with um, the care that they're receiving in hospice, but perhaps read about a new um, research trial that they think they want to get in on and apply for. Um, and that's fine. It, hospice is revocable. It's your choice. It's, um, it's up to you whether you want to take advantage of the benefit or not. Some people come on hospice and when we've reconciled all of their medications and discontinued some of the ones that may be causing more of a symptom burden and you feel better, um, there may be an inclination to say, well, you know what, I do feel better now and I have changed my mind and perhaps now I feel strong enough to, to want to go back and um, get additional treatment. Perfectly fine. You can revoke hospice at any time. Um, you can go seek whatever treatments or therapies you would like. And if such time as you want to come back onto hospice, that's possible too, as long as you meet eligibility criteria at that time. And you can also switch hospice providers. Um, while many of the benefits and advantages are the same across the board with hospice providers, it may just be that you don't care for your nurse or you don't care for the organization or there's just something that you're unhappy with or you've heard that another hospice has, I don't know, a cellist that will come to your home and you particularly want that volunteer service. You can change hospices and the current hospice that you have will actually facilitate that happening. Um, to make sure that there is a seamless transition of care, that if you go with the other hospice, they won't withdraw all of their services and equipment days before your other service um, kicks in and so that you're left without a hospital bed or medications. They'll give you plenty of medications to make sure that you're covered for the interim until your other hospice provider get, gets up and running. Um, and it's not uncommon and it's okay. and we understand. So starting the conversation about hospice and palliative care can almost be the worst part of getting the assistance and help. Um, and I think particularly with um, aggressive diseases where there's a lot of emphasis on fighting the disease and um, being strong and tolerating a lot, it can be very difficult for anybody to broach the subject of what will happen if this doesn't work, because nobody wants to think about what will happen if this latest treatment doesn't work, or we run out of options, or simply allowing the patient to give voice to the fact that maybe they don't want to continue on with treatment, but they feel as if they have to, because if they don't, they would be letting somebody down. Um, you're not letting anybody down. Um, it's ultimately your life and your decisions should be respected. Um, I think some of the language that surrounds um, diseases like cancer, can be very, you know, fight oriented, which by extension implies that if you say, look, I can't do it anymore, I don't want to do it anymore, that somehow you're not fighting hard enough for your loved ones. And it can be very challenging to broach that topic. Um, mostly we recommend always with advanced care planning that you start to talk about these things when you're well before you get the diagnosis, before you go into the treatments, before things may de-escalate quickly um, and you're not able to make your wishes known. Um, you know, as a, as a palliative and hospice provider, the mo most heart-wrenching thing for me is treating somebody at end of life and when I see the burden that the family carries, 
because they never had a conversation and they're not really sure if they're doing the right thing, that burden stays with you because you are making decisions that you hope and think are the best decisions or hope and think that it's what your loved one would have wanted. But sometimes you never get the answers and you never know whether that was the right decision. Um, I always think about advanced care planning or at least conversations regarding advanced care planning are the gift that I give my loved ones because I don't want to burden them with having to make those decisions with no idea of what my wishes might have been. Um, I, some years ago, um, memorialized my wishes. Um, I'm not sick, I wasn't then. Um, but everybody I think around me knows what my wishes are. Um, and the person actually who I have asked to make sure that my wishes are, are adhered to, should I am not able, be able to voice them for myself, is not the person you would think it is because the person closest to me, I didn't want to put that burden on them. Um, I didn't feel like they would be able to carry out my wishes because it would be too hard for them. And so I relieved them of that burden by um, asking somebody who I knew would do what I wanted done at the end, um, if and when it came to that. And sometimes that can be a social conversation that needs to be had too, because many people think they have to give power of attorney to their next of kin, whether it be the wife or the eldest son, or the daughter, um, but sometimes you may decide it's better to to give that responsibility to somebody who has a little bit more distance. And if that's the case, then again, that's that's a gift that you are leaving your loved one. Um, but these are some of the things that often, as palliative care providers, when we're sitting sort of talking with families about advanced care planning and, and their wants and needs. These really are sort of the, the, the key questions. Any one of these questions, even simply, do you want to die in your home, can be the start of a conversation. It can be breaking down that barrier, that bridge to nobody wanting to bring this topic up, especially not when you're fighting a disease. Um, where do you want to be at the end and who do you want there? Um, what arrangements would you like to be part of? Is there anything that you would want us to do for you? Um, and of course, the more common ones are CPR and feeding tubes. Um, and really uh, unable to drink um, or eat is a common cause of, of pain and anguish for family members who are left making these decisions when their loved ones are not able to make their opinion known and they have to make them on their behalf. So it's just something to keep in mind and it's a conversation that can be had. And while it may sound grim um, and overwhelming, sometimes the best time for these conversations is around the holidays when the family is together and the family are celebrating life um, and events and milestones in life. Um, doesn't have to be a dark conversation, um, but it can be the start of something. It can be the start of uh, uh, an understanding of what you would want. So referrals to both palliative and hospice care work pretty much the same way as um, any other referral to a specialist would work. And that really is all we are. We're, we're specialists in the same way that you might have a pulmonologist or an oncologist um, or a gastroenterologist. We're another specialist. Um, another misconception, you do not have to be a DNR to enroll in palliative, certainly, and not even in hospice. Um, but again, there are misconceptions surrounding DNR. We hear all the time of people saying, I don't want to be DNR because then I won't get the care I need. 
um, DNR means do not resuscitate. It means do not perform CPR, but it doesn't mean do not treat. It doesn't mean you won't get symptoms managed. It doesn't mean that you will be outside of the healthcare system. It just means that you don't want that part of the healthcare services that are being offered to you. I think this is the essence of the, of the point I've been sort of making on the last two slides. Um, I mean, a lot of these documents have very legal, very official sounding names and people worry that they will be expensive. And certainly if you go to an attorney to have something drawn up, then you would be incurring expenses. Um, but an advanced directive is ultimately the end of the day. It's you're stating your preferences for your healthcare wishes about what you want and more specifically what you don't want at end of life so that other people won't be forced to make those decisions for you. And it also allows you to choose who you want to represent you and advocate for you at a time in your life where you are not able to. So simple steps to advance care planning are just think carefully about what you want. Because um, this is, really is a document that's all about you and carrying out your wishes. Discuss it with, um, with the people who are important to you and ask them to honor your choices. But they can only honor them if they know them. And share whatever documents you have or feelings or sentiments with your primary care provider, um, with everybody on your medical team. Um, a lot of people put them in a magnetic envelope and put them on the front of their refrigerator, um, particularly if you've got a, a condition that could cause you to decline rapidly and need um, 911 to respond to you. Having your wishes on the refrigerator is probably the first place they will look for it if you're not able to tell them and document them. It doesn't have to be very expensive. It doesn't have to be through a lawyer. There are a lot of um, ways you can memorialize your wishes without going to that expense if you don't want to. So questions, I, I see we've, there's a couple in the question and answer, but Lord has it, been monitoring the, the chat page for me. And so how are we doing? Um, we have two questions through our question and answer. Um, so this individual says that while they appreciate what should happen, they often see huge gaps in hospice and palliative care with patients in our community. How do you suggest the best way for cholangio carcinoma patients to navigate the issues with their hospice and palliative care? Um, I, if they can elaborate in the chat, that would be nice because um, I'm not sure what the breakdown is. Is it a rural area where there just simply aren't any providers, um, which can sometimes be the case. Um, certainly at HFA in the last few weeks, we've been hearing from people who are having a challenging time finding a hospice that will take them, particularly if they're in a rural area because of staffing shortages. Um, and that ha is having an impact. We are seeing that. And of course, that's pa part of the myth is that hospice will, will take on everything and do everything. And you'll have someone there around the clock. And that simply was not what it was ever designed for. It was designed to be a supplement to family caregivers. But I, I would agree in a lot of instances, um, that's unrealistic because while hospice and palliative care is for all age groups, certainly a large percentage of the people that avail themselves of hospice services are elderly and have elderly partners and families that are not always local. So there are gaps. Uh, and I don't think anybody, um, certainly not from HFA, would 
pretend that there are no gaps in services, that there are there is a greater demand for these services in some areas than there are providers. Um, but so it I, seems like um, it's not necessarily in a smaller rural area, regardless. It's more of like perhaps lack of um, good pain control and other issues like that. So how to address if there isn't um, appropriate pain control measures happening for the patient, um, like how would someone maybe address those issues if you have any recommendations? If they're already with a palliative care team or a hospice team and their pain is not managed, they need a different team. And so you would recommend looking for a different hospice or a different palliative care team? Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. If this if the issue has been addressed multiple times, that the pain is not controlled, um, this is a, a service for you. Um, and pain is one of the biggest things that um, is the reason people turn to hospice and palliative care. Now, I, I have to say this too, though, that as a provider, you know, <laughs> it, this is getting into a little bit specifics, but it can be very challenging to control pain if the family or the patient is reluctant to be sedated in any way at all. Um, because there are certain types of pain that are very severe and need serious medications at very high doses. And there can be barriers to us giving appropriate doses to control pain because the family or the patient are fearful that they won't be alert and oriented. That's a trade-off that we can't do a whole lot about. Um, because so maybe that goes back to having pain. those conversations of like if the pain is, you know, ahead of time, if that's possible. Yeah, yeah. And I, you know, and I would hate to say or imply that if you're in hospice or palliative care, you will be pain free. But the pain certainly shouldn't be intolerable. And if it is intolerable, then we should be able to titrate medications. And it may be up to the point we're titrating up to a dosage where you or, the, or your loved one is going to be lethargic or not as able to interact with you. But that is the decision you have to make. And we do see it. And it's like there's a trade-off sometimes between being alert and oriented and being able to engage uh, and having the pain 100% controlled, but the cost for that may be that you are going to be lethargic and not as engaged or not able to talk with your loved ones. Um, another question that came in was how one would approach their local hospital system in providing outpatient palliative care as the only thing available for palliative care currently is inpatient. I don't know if you can answer that. And if you can't, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't because I wish I could say that, you know, palliative care was, was everywhere and was available to everyone. Um, it isn't, but it, it it surprises me that palliative care is only available inpatient. Um, I'm wondering if there is a local practitioner. I mean, I think I mentioned earlier that sometimes you don't get the full interdisciplinary team, but there happens to be a physician or a nurse practitioner locally who will consult as an outpatient for palliative care. So maybe just asking, or if there's a resource that you would recommend, um, just continuing to ask like the nurse practitioner or someone in the actual, um, like current healthcare team, perhaps. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it, it's really challenging me for, to answer because again, I don't, I, I don't know where this is. Um, sure. No, that's okay. No yeah. problem. <laughs> I have another question for you. If you have any, um, 
is there a good way to look up hospice locations um, near anyone, any particular individual that are considered maybe more reputable? Is there a way that someone can look for hospice mm -hmm. um, if it's not through a direct referral? Yeah, they can come to the Hospice Foundation of America and we'll help them find a provider close to them. Um, or they can go to carecompare.com um, so, or is it dot gov? I can let you know. Um, but Medicare has a care compare where you can um, go online and plug in your zip code and it will give you a list of all of the either palliative or hospice providers in your zip code. And if they are big enough, if they are large enough and have enough patient volume, um, you can compare the ratings that they've received from patients. Okay, thank you. Um, and I don't know if Angela, you can answer. Amy, I know that you're there also. If uh, the Hospice Foundation has a, um, like a, a perspective on death with dignity as an organization. That was a question as well. Yeah, I don't know if Amy wants to jump in on that. Sure. Yeah. So, hi, I'm I'm Amy Tucci. I'm president of Hospice Foundation of America, and I'm just uh, on the panel part. Uh, they're not presenting, obviously, but I can answer that. Um, we have taken a our board of directors has taken a neutral position on that. Um, we don't feel that um, hospice care. Uh, is we we feel that hospice care is death with dignity. Um, we uh, realize that it's legal. Uh, physician aid and dying or medical aid and dying is legal in some states, um, but we don't endorse it. Um, we don't object to it. If it's a person's right, they have that autonomous right. Um, it's a lot more complicated for hospices. Um, hospices have to make their own internal decisions on whether they're going to participate and individual hospice workers have to make um, a decision on whether they're going to participate if somebody chooses to use that, that those laws in states where it is legal. Um, as you know, I think it's legal uh, Medical aid in dying is legal in about 14 states and territories right now. Um, and there's, it's probably going to continue to um, be legislation that gets passed in more states. Um, but it is uh, really kind of counter the hospice philosophy in many ways. Um, however, I will say that most patients who use um, death with dignity laws are hospice patients um, because they have to fit meet certain criteria and those overlap many times with hospice patients criteria. Um, so, yeah. That Thank you, it. Amy. <laughs> and I just see one, one other question um, in the chat bar. Uh, about malignant ascites um, and having that drained weekly in paracentesis. Um, yeah, that, that would normally absolutely be covered by hospice. Um, do that quite frequently because that does affect um, pain control. And without having that done, we realize the discomfort. So yeah, that's definitely something that would be available to hospice patients. Great. Thank you. I don't see any other questions coming in. Um, but if anyone has any other questions um, that you know come up later, you can always email our advocacy at qrcca.org and we can um, help filter those questions to Angela and maybe she can help answer them for us. Um, and then I have the link here that you sent to me, Amy. Um, and we can definitely post that as well. I'm trying to make sure I have, I don't have access to our chat, but I will send it and we will post it with our um, webinar. Thank you both for being here with us and sharing this information. We appreciate it. Thank you everyone for joining.
I hope you all have a good afternoon or evening, wherever you are. Thank you for having us. Take care. Mm -hmm.